Hello, my name is Braylon Beaver. I'm a behavior specialist that works at Easter Seals in the Bucks Division. And with me is? Hi, I'm Jackie Dahl. I'm a behavior specialist at Montgomery County Easter Seals. And we're gonna talk about errorless teaching procedure. Um, so I hope this gives you a better understanding of errorless teaching procedure by when we're done with it. Let's get started. Um, first off, we're in the process of making these training videos. Um, I would suggest seeing the introduction to verbal behavior before you watch this one, and also the variable ratio training before you watch this one. Um, possibly the operants training if you need a brush up on those as well. Um, but the idea is with errorless teaching is that you're gonna use this procedure to teach new targets. So um, basically you're using this to make sure the teacher, uh, the student does not practice an error, okay? So these are targets that you know they don't know yet, basically. Before we get started, let me move my picture. Uh, let's do a refresher on prompt hierarchy. So, you're already using prompts when you present the question. For example, for an LR, you're already using a verbal prompt. So if I say, Jackie, clap your hands, I'm already using a verbal prompt. Jackie, can I not hear you? One sec, guys. Oh, she's good. She's good. <laughs> Sorry, she faked me out. I'm already, I'm already giving Jackie the verbal prompt. What would be a more intrusive prompt would be if I gestured to. So if I said, Jackie, clap your hands, right? Or if I modeled it, Jackie, clap your hands. It's more and more invasive, correct? Um, it's natural for you to increase your prompting in this way. Um, for imitation, you are already modeling. You're already way down in that middle. So which is why when we need to prompt an imitation, we go to a partial or a physical, full physical prompt. Um, Jackie, do you have anything to add? No, I do find though having this visual, the prompt hierarchy actually printed out and you know in the vicinity of your teaching area is really helpful for a quick reference. Yeah. It really is. And in that moment, it's really easy to forget and to kind of, you know, go with a gut instinct, but you might be missing a few steps in between. All right. So the sequence that we are going to talk about that is the errorless teaching procedure is prompt, transfer, distractor, check. And if you come away with anything, this is what I would love for you to come away with. It's the whole errorless teaching procedure. Prompt, transfer, distractor, check. If we were face to face, I would have you guys repeat it. It's really something that just needs to be memorized. I haven't come up with a cute little way to learn it. I wish we could, that would be good. Um, <laughs> if anybody does, please come to me. <laughs> um, but you just gotta learn it. Prompt, transfer, distractor, check. Um, we can talk about how to, how to learn this later, but um, I know some classrooms have this posted, especially some that have VB sessions, um, and that's a great way of kind of having that visual reminder up there so that when you're in that moment and you might get a hiccup, you can just look up and be like, okay, wait, if I distract her, that's what I'm doing. Okay, check, right? Okay, so um, there are certain, let me see where I can put us. Oh wait, I think if I go, okay. There are certain operands that lean better to doing a certain prompt. Um, and there are certain ways to teach the VB map, the VB, program so that you can give yourself prompts later on. So for example, with early learners, I usually start with listener response, 
and imitation. Those are my two um, targets that, two operands that I start with. The reason is, if I teach imitation, I can use it as a prompt for the listener response. So, for example, with this clap hands, if I've already taught Jackie that when I say do this and I clap my hands, she claps her hands, the listener response is me adding the words, right? Instead of just do this, it's me saying clap your hands. And if she doesn't get that, I can then add that model that she's already mastered. Um, I did have one student who had very high listener response skills. And he actually was better at following the direction than he was at the imitation. We actually had to pull that backwards, which was very interesting. But that is a, it was a very weird case, but it definitely shows that every child is different. And the beauty of the VB program is that you're individualizing it to each specific child. So you might have that child who has that really high language skill. And you're like, I know he knows what I'm saying. He just doesn't understand that looking at me and modeling what I do is what I want. So you can reverse it. Um, for, so let me see. For matching, you can use a gestural prompt. You can model it. You can do a partial for physical. Um, for tacting, there are a lot of very good um, prompts that you can use. So, for example, you can use the echoic if the child has good echoic skills. Um, you can also use the follow-up of following a direction. So, for example, let's say I'm trying to teach the child that when he sees this picture, he says pizza. Okay? I can do the prompt of touch pizza what is this? Pizza. So how I'm pairing those together. Um, or if he has a code skills, you can also do the prompt of what is it? Pizza. And hoping that he echoes pizza. You can also obviously pull that back to only saying partial of what the word is. So it would be, what is this? P or Pez, you know, you're warming them up to saying pizza. And then interverbal, um, you can use echoic or tact, and I've done both. So I've had it where, um, um, I know for Patan, they recommend index cards for everything. So we've had the index card and it says like, um, meow meow says A, and it's a fill in the blank interverbal. On the back of it, you have the picture of the cat. So what you do is you say, meow, meow, says A. And if the child isn't saying cat, you flash them the picture of cat. And then you withdraw it, and they say cat. Um, I, always, I found that amazing, especially when you had enough cards to staple that picture on, and like that was the card. Um, uh, you don't always have enough cards to dedicate to that. But anyway, I've also, if you teach, um, you're trying to teach a child what their name is, and you've already taught the listener based on a picture, so you've already, when you show them a picture of themselves, they say John. You know, so then you can say, what is your name? and then show them the picture of themselves because they've already identified John. Um, you can also do that um, with textural, so with a higher level learner. I have taught them how to, what their address is by having it written out and then covering portions of it so that they don't become prompt dependent once they've kind of gotten that flow. And you can also use that good old fashioned echoic of what is your name? John. He echoes John. Um, Jackie, do you have anything to add? Um, 
No, but I, I do think having your materials organized, like you mentioned with the cards and having the prompts right there. So if you have to quickly go to a prompt, it's there. You're not looking for it or screaming across the room, where's that picture of the cat? You know, I, I think that's really important to stay organized. Yeah. These are, this should be the things they got wrong on the probe sheet. So when you're making your probes, you should in your mind be thinking, okay, how am I going to prompt this? Am I, you know, and if it's just, you're going to use a physical prompt, you're going to fade that out. Okay. But if you're like, I'm going to prompt it, you know, using this train, then you need the train, <laughs> you know, you need that picture. You need to, you need to be prepared. Um, all right. So let me move my picture again. So the first step is prompt. So as we talked about with the prompt hierarchy, you're going to use a higher level and ask the target again and make sure the student is accurate. So um, if it's the example is touch car, um, you might tap the picture. So that would be um, a model. You're modeling what you want them to do. And you're going to block the child's hand from touching any of their car. Right? Um, this makes it errorless. When you think errorless, it's because you're forcing them to get it right. Um, then, second question, second question, don't shuffle the cards. Keep, you know, don't shuffle the materials. Don't switch it up. You're going to use a lower level of prompting and you're going to ask the same target again. Um, and still ensure that they get it accurate. So my example was, I'm teaching touch car, um, and before I modeled it for him. Now I might just block, and just kind of put my elbow where it needs to be and make sure they're not gonna touch any other cards, but I'm still gonna ask the question and see where it goes. Um, you could also, you know, kind of, there are many ways to finesse a lesser prompt. So, you know, it could be a little bit of a, it's over there, you know, <laughs> um, it could be anything, but it is lower than that first prompt. Um, then you're going to do a distractor, which this is my favorite illustration. Um, <laughs> so you're going to distract the child from the teaching target by asking him or her unknown. So this is, again, um, uh, one of the reasons that knowns are so important is because you need to have them in your back pocket, ready to pull out to distract. Um, and again, they should get this answer correct. They don't all the time. I admit that. But they should, it should be easy. And then depending on the child's VR, you could ask them multiple distractors. Um, for early learners, it's definitely one. <laughs> um, but for higher level learners or children that can, you know, accept more than one distractor, it is kind of good to scroll through and do two or three. Okay. And then, oh, look. See, I knew this was somewhere in here. The importance of the known box. So we had just mentioned that your distractor is going to be a known. So here's our some benefits of why a known box. I have had, um, I have had one-on-ones and therapists kind of ask me, why do you keep asking the questions if they have it mastered? And the reason is um, because we need to be able to pull these out as an easy, right? So, Continually checking that your student has this skill and isn't losing this skill is another very big um, reason to do this. I've had a lot of students who over the weekend, over break, just for, you know, just forget what you taught them. And so bringing it up again and again in the known box is a way for them to use that skill. And also, I will say, if you actually do use a box, um, using 
I find it very gratifying to see all of those cards pile up and to know that your ch child is learning more and more and more things, right? Oftentimes in a VB program, it is very, very small steps forward. So having those written down, stuck together, you can be like, oh, in September we were here, but now we're here. Like, yes, this is why we're doing this. This is why this child's making progress. Um, also, using the known cards keeps the 80-20 ratio. And again, the 80-20 is 80% 80 easy, 20% hard. So that also comes into play when you're deciding how many distractors to do because you've done one, two hard, one easy, you know, is your distractor. You could make that two easy, three easy. At least now you're 50%, right? You also can see the importance of doing the knowns and easies in between your teaching trials of the errorless correction targets, right? We need to keep that ratio high. All right, and so then, prompt, transfer, distractor, check. After the distractor, ask the targeted error question again. So still, you haven't really rearranged the cards. Use as little prompting as possible, but ensure that the student succeeds. So. Um, I kind of like to use the same level of prompt that was successful in the transfer. So if that was, I kind of blocked them from touching everything else, then that's, you know, the level of prompt you would do for this check. And again, they should get it correct. If not, we will talk about it in error, error correction. Um, but this should be a, I forgot about this target for a little bit, and now I'm back to it and I remember it is what we're hoping for. Jackie, do you have anything to add? No, I think you made a really good point about using the same level of prompting. I think that's really important because we do want to set our kids up for success. Yeah, it's, it's called errorless for a reason. We don't want them to practice mistakes. Um, so uh, if you've already done our VR training, uh, you should be thinking in your head, how do I keep my VR low? You're asking me do, to do a sequence of four, but on the other hand, you told me this kid has a VR of one to one. How do I make this happen? Um, so the key is that you need to reinforce um, in between the sequence. So that might mean that you know, you're giving that kid 10 seconds of iPad time, but in your head, you're like, I'm going back and we're doing a distractor after this. And then I'm going back and I'm doing the check after this, you know, cause you're still in the midst of doing that sequence. So I have some examples here. I have two examples. Um, I can already think of a third one where you could keep that VR low. So it's always good to reinforce during a prompt, um, what we don't want to reinforce is if there's an error. So if they erred on your transfer, you don't want to reinforce at that time, even though in your mind you were counting and you were like, I'm going to reinforce this next one. And they erred and you're like, can't reinforce the next one, you know. So in this sequence, we did a prompt and we reinforced the so one to one. We did a transfer. We did a distract and we reinforced and we did a check and we reinforced. Um, or I have in the other one that you, that you reinforced during the transfer. You could also, if you needed to, um, reinforce a separate trial. So just the next time, just give more reinforcement to lower that VR. Um, and again, like I stated in the VR training, it is not a math test, <laughs> okay? You should not be sweating counting your VR. You should be saying he has limited, he doesn't, he's not having behaviors, he seems to be enjoying sitting here, we're getting work done, my VR is right. 
you know, this is good. I'm in a good spot. Um, so, uh, moving on. This is just, like I said, if you take away anything, it's this sequence. So we're going to repeat it. Prompt, transfer, distractor, check. Um, so me and Jackie are going to give you some examples. I have, I have my cards here, which I'm excited about. So let me see, what should we use? Okay. All right, so this is one of my favorites. It's a picture of a penguin, obviously. Um, we're, I'm going to teach Jackie to do this errorlessly. We're going to use tacting because, you know, we're both on a video call, so it's very hard to do a lot of the other ones. Um, but how about this? So I'm going to be teaching her that when she sees this card, um, it's a penguin. Okay? So, Jackie, what is this? Penguin. Penguin. What is this? Huh? Penguin. Jackie, clap your hands. Jackie, what is this? Puh. Penguin. Very good. So I used an acoic to help her as the prompt. Um, let me see. How could we... Why don't I show you a demo of using it, um, of doing the interverbal and using the tact as the prompt. So kind of that. We're going to pretend that I flip the card and I show her what this is. So we're going to call it plant. Okay. Fantastic. Um, Jackie, in the woods, what do you find? Plant. Jackie, in the woods, what do you find? Huh? Plant. Good job. Jackie, can you touch your nose? Jackie, what color is this? Red. Jackie, in the woods, you find a plant. Now, because I didn't want to lessen the prompt by like flashing her the car <laughs> and making it like a, what was that moment for her? I switched because an echoic is lesser of a prompt than the visual. So I switched from showing her the picture to giving her a small piece of the echoic, okay? Um, you can mix and match your prompts. It is completely fine. Um, let's do, let me see. Just trying to see how we can. Why don't I show you the, um, the listener response from an, Im an imitation? Why don't I show you guys that one? That one's actually probably something that we will use often with our early learners. So let's give the example of clapping hands. So like I said before, I've already taught her how to do this. I've already taught the imitation. So I'm going to transfer it with um, using the LR. So Jackie, clap your hands. So that was my full prompt. Jackie, clap your hands. Jackie, do this. Jackie, clap your hands. Okay? You can see how you can use those imitation skills and transfer them to an LR. Um, all right, Jackie, can you think of any other example? I feel like, I feel like we got them. What do you think? Yeah, I, th I think the last one is the one that we definitely use most often. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely is. Um, all right, so my last slide is a homework slide. So if you are new to errorless teaching or if it has been a while, I know this was a refresher for me when I made this course, uh, the best way to learn is to become comfortable with it is to practice. Uh, so grab a friend, grab a coworker, grab somebody who's willing to kind of do this with you a few times. <laughs> and complete it until you're confident. I remember learning this. You, I remember feeling like, like, I, like I was jittery. Like, wait, I do this? Oh, wait, this one next? This one next? Um, so you, you really just need, <laughs> you need to practice it. The more you practice, the more it's gonna, gonna become second nature. Also, 
Um, I do remember for me, I wrote down the steps and had it like on a post-it note next to me while I was trying it so that when you got stuck, you could look down and be like, I'm on this step, let's go. Um, and then after I became pretty comfortable with it, I flipped it over um, so that you, you aren't dependent on it. Um, Good idea. And please don't be afraid to laugh at your mistakes. Um, I do remember this being very funny and very like tense, like frustrated, like, oh, I, I messed this up again. Okay, like one more time um, moments. So please don't be afraid to laugh. Um, and if you have any questions on Arrow is Teaching, uh, the BSC or Megan for the EI Center would be more than willing to help you um, with this and to kind of explain any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you so much.